you make it a point in the book that self-care doesn't necessarily, it doesn't mean like going to get a bubble bath or whatever. It's really taking care of what's happening to you. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. I love talking about self-care. And yes, we got to debunk this self-care myth that it means two hour long, you know, bubble baths and week long meditation retreats. And those are great if we have time for those, but how many of us really have time for that, right? So what I talk to my high achievers with anxiety and just all of us in general, what we need to do is prioritize self-care, but in a streamlined way so it feels doable. If we keep it feeling doable, we'll keep doing it, right? So what I've come up with and I talk about in my book, The Happy High Achiever, is the four science-based self-care fundamentals that will give you the best bang for your buck. If you're going to be putting time and energy into self-care and you're already feeling overwhelmed, you have an overextended schedule, we got to get really strategic, right? So there's four self-care fundamentals and how I help people remember them is with the acronym SELF. So it's S. E-L-F. And I can run through those for you if you want. Sure. Um, okay. So S is sleep. So sleep, we want to aim for seven hours or more a night. As adults, we need seven or more hours a night. And why is that so important? I think we know how we feel when we're not getting good sleep. And research shows chronic lack of rest can really negatively impact things like memory, concentration, attention. But conversely, if we get good sleep, so again, that seven hours or more a night, it can really improve things like productivity, problem solving, memory. So there's so many benefits to good sleep. So sleep is essential. Then the E in self-care is exercise. And again, I think we know how important it is to exercise. Here I like to really highlight that our aim is just 30 minutes or more most days. And I think for high achievers, sometimes we have this like go big mentality, you know, this all or nothing kind of thinking that unfortunately can stymie our progress because I'll have patients saying, well, Dr. Ed, I need to go to the gym, you know, five days a week. And if they only go three, they feel like they failed and then they just stop going to the gym. So if we can keep it really doable and really highlight the benefits of something like walking, I love to walk and there's a super low risk of injury with walking. And what we know, it's a really efficient way to metabolize cortisol. So cortisol, our stress hormone, walking, physical activity is one of the most efficient ways to reduce cortisol. So it's going to be really effective for preventing and healing burnout. So that's the E. L of SELF for self-care is look forward. And this is the one that sometimes patients and people who have talked to about the Happy High Achiever book are like, wow, I didn't really think of this as self-care, but the L is look forward. And our goal is to have at least one pleasant activity to look forward to every week. Why is that so important? Because it provides a powerful mood boost when we have something to look forward to. Just the anticipation of something positive is powerful, right? Think about planning a vacation. Just thinking about the vacation, even if it's weeks away, gets you excited. So what we have to do is just modify that for the for our everyday busy lives and keep it really doable because we can't go on vacation every week. Um, it is helpful to know when our next vacation will be, but on the, you know, the daily or in a week, just have one thing a week that feels doable, like planning a meetup with a friend or booking a massage. Or for me, sometimes I'm like, I'm just going to get my favorite takeout on Thursday night after a long day. And then in the days leading up to that, remind yourself that you have this great thing you're looking forward to. And then it's like double bang for your buck, right? You'll enjoy the activity when you're doing it and just when you're thinking about it. So that's the L. And then the last one of SELF is fuel. And this, again, we really know we got to fuel our body well with good nutrition and hydration because it really will impact our cognitive performance. And sometimes I'll see people just going hours and hours without eating. And I'm like, guys, we got to help you make you know, healthy eating convenient. So I'm like, keep snacks with you. If you're out traveling, bring some mixed nuts, a piece of fruit, a protein bar. So people, you know, if they're studying for something, bring it to the library with you. If you're at your desk and you're feeling like you're swamped with meetings, keep something convenient right near you. So fuel your body and brain with good nutrition and hydration. Drinking water really does matter. So I'm like, keep that handy. And the other thing is to fuel your mind with quiet. 
Think about how much of our day we're just bombarded, barraged with information, problems to solve, scrolling on our phones. And so if we can just strategically take even a minute or two, more is great, but just a minute or two each day to do some deep breathing, which I teach to a lot of patients, um, to do things like getting out into nature, into green spaces or blue spaces. So, you know, parks or just your backyard or get near the ocean or rivers. We know from research, it helps calm the nervous system. So just a little bit of a rest and recharge can make all the difference for our functioning. So again, that's SELF, sleep, exercise, look forward and fuel. Those are the four science-based uh, self-care fundamentals to prioritize, to keep yourself energized so you can move forward and feel and be your best. And what I love about that is that it's doable. Like you said, doable. They don't have to be huge grand gesture gestures, just like you said, just like yes. the look forward, getting something to eat, or even I'm going to go make me my cup of coffee and put this special cream in it or whatever. It, it's just, yeah, very doable. Yep. And that's really the crucial part is that we've mm -hmm. got to keep it doable and stay flexible with how we implement it. So if someone writes schedules, um, one pleasant activity that for some reason, like it gets rained out or they can't go to, I really encourage patients adapt as necessary, stay flexible with things, just plan something else to do that day that you enjoy. And just like you're saying, it can be something little, like I make sure I have like hand lotion that I like to use or my little stress management ball that I'm like, okay, I'm going to make sure that I plan that in for a day when I like know it's going to be a long day of sitting. I'll be like, I'm going to make sure that that's next to me so that I can use that. That seems so small, right? But these little moments of self-care, these little moments, these micro moments of self-care, they add up. And the additive effect is what's really going to be protective of our energy. I always talk about protector energy, protector sparkle. You know, we have to protect that energy so that we can continue to feel and be our best because everybody out there deserves that. We all deserve to feel and be our best. The book is called The Happy High Achiever. How do you know when you're a high achiever? Is it, you know, what do you look for and say, mm, maybe I meet these requirements, maybe I meet these characterizations? Oh, that is such a good question. It's so, oh, such a good question. I actually just did a presentation for my colleagues um, about helping anxious high achievers, so uh, high achieving patients with anxiety. And I started with, how will we know we're a high achiever, right? And so this one, here's some tricky it's a little tricky. So when I was talking about anxious high achievers with clinicians, I was talking to mental health providers. I said, diagnostically, we know what to listen for, for anxiety, right? So what we're listening for are things like, you know, I'm, I'm really having a lot of worry about a lot of different things and, and feeling it difficult to control the worry. I'm feeling anxious. We know what kind of panic symptoms so forth to, so that we know, but how do we know that the high achiever part, right? There's, it's tricky, there's complexity, because often high achievers don't come in identifying as high achievers. Often patients will come in, especially if they're coming in for therapy, so it's a, a different intensity level, right? If, if patients are coming in saying, I'm really struggling with anxiety, they will say just that. They know, hey, doctor, I'm really struggling with anxiety, I'm struggling with worry. So that's helpful. It helps when they're you know like coming in identifying it but they won't come in saying they're a high achiever because almost a hallmark of being a high achiever is that people will point to what they haven't done or achieved yet. And so that's the issue I'm finding is if people are coming in to see me, they'll say, but you know, I haven't made partner at the law firm. So I work with a lot of lawyers, like, but I haven't made partner at the firm or, well, I haven't run a marathon. So they'll point to achievements or goals they haven't yet accomplished. The other thing that the second thing that I see the kind of, there's two main things. They point to goals they haven't achieved yet, or they point to how they don't measure up against someone else. They'll say, but my colleagues have higher titles than I do, you know, at their company, or they'll say, well, you know, Dr. A, all my friends are married, you know, and they, they own their own homes. I don't, I'm not a high achiever. So they'll point to ways in which they aren't a high achiever rather than give themselves credit for all the things they've done. The number five essential, changing your shoulds to cans. Can oh, you talk about that? that? 
<laughs> yes, absolutely. And I just have to say thank you so much, ladies. I love to hear that the content in the book is really resonating with you and that it's feeling practical. That's really one of my yes. major goals is to provide practical, actionable science-based strategies and skills. Because when patients come in to see me, they'll say, all right, Dr. A, like bullet pointed for me, you know, <laughs> and these are JDs, they're lawyers, they're doctors, they're researchers, there's grad students. And so it just, they just need something practical in their days to help them move forward, right? And so really clear, concise, practical information. So I'm so glad that it's resonating with you. Um, and I love talking about shoulds. Oh, hallmark of high achievers, right? We should all of ourselves. And there's three ways that we often should. And I talk about this in the happy high achiever. We should ourselves, we should others, and we should situations. So when we should ourselves, right? I should be able to handle this. I should be doing more. I should, you know, I should be able to keep up. I should be going to the gym <laughs> more. Um, all the shoulds. That how does that make us feel, right? So thoughts, feelings, behaviors, they all directly, you know, um, re relate. They all directly impact each other, right? So thoughts, feelings, behaviors. If we're thinking, I should be going to the gym every day, how does that make us feel? Not good, right? Like deficient. We all we often will feel deflated actually less motivated. So paradoxically, the very thing we're shooting about uh, ourselves about, we're actually making it less likely that we're going to do that very thing because we're making ourselves feel bad, right? We're going to feel guilty. And when we're feeling demotivated, guilty, bad about ourselves behaviorally, does that move us forward? Not usually. And not certainly not sustainably if we're not feeling good about ourselves. So that's where with the shoulds, I decision tree it out with patients. So if they're like, oh, Dr. A, I should be going to the gym more. I'll ask them, do you want to go to the gym? Do you think it would be helpful or do you think you must? And I love it because my patients are so candid and they're like, I definitely don't want to. And I'm like, okay, so it's not that you want to. Do you feel you must? No. And I'm like, so what is it? And they're like, well, I just think it'd be helpful to go to the gym. And I'll say, well, why, right? So if you stay curious with why you're telling yourself a should, that's what's gonna actually help unstick you. The should will just keep people stuck behaviorally and feeling bad about themselves. So I'll get, I kind of drill down to like, what, why are you telling yourself this? And they'll say, well, I think it would be helpful. I know that exercise helps, you know, you've talked about stress management. I know it's good for my health. And then, then we can really get into the nitty gritty of effective problem solving and goal setting. And I'll say, so what I'm hearing is that you think it would be helpful to exercise. And they're like, yeah. I'm like, do you need to go to the gym to exercise necessarily? Well, no. All right. So now we're getting somewhere. I'm like, well, what could you do? Let's see. And so we'll brainstorm. And it often is just bring your sneakers to you know work and go walk for you know, 15, 20 minutes at your lunch break. Or I have a lot of people getting, you know, at home gym equipment, but something like a treadmill or even now they have like walking pads, which is like a treadmill, but smaller footprint. So I have people finding ways to do walking or exercise that's more convenient. And often high achievers will be like, but does that count? I don't, I don't have to go to the gym. And I'm like, you really don't have to go to the gym. And in fact, if you're not going to the gym, that's not actually even a helpful kind of goal to set for yourself because you're not doing it and you're just going to feel worse and you're going to kind of feed into that negative feedback loop. Can you talk about the trifecta, which mm -hmm. you said neg um, mind reading, what would be the other two parts of that trifecta? Yes. So the troublesome trifecta, the first one is all or nothing thinking. And we hit on that one with perfectionism. So all or nothing thinking is forcing a dichotomy where there isn't one. So black and white thinking. So things like I need to be perfect or I'm a failure or something like if I hear patients say like everything, you know, everyone needs to be totally blown away by my project, Dr. A, you know, so everything, everyone, or, or in the other direction, no one, always, never, any of those really extremes, those absolutes, when we're forcing our thoughts into absolutes, almost always life is not lived in the absolutes. It's lived more in the middle in the gray, right? So all or nothing thinking absolutely can help, uh, can hinder high achievers um, striving for excellence. So all or nothing thinking, the second one of the troublesome trifecta is the jumping to conclusions. And jumping to conclusions comes in kind of two flavors. It's that negative fortune telling. So it's not gonna go well. 
Um, I'm not going to get into the university I want, or I'm not going to get the job I want. And then the other kind of flavor of negative fortune telling is mind reading. It is that like, they're not going to like me. They're going to think I'm incompetent. So that's the mind reading where we're assuming we know what other people are thinking about us, which can we ever know what people are thinking? No, I often say the only way we know what people are thinking is if they tell us and they tell us the truth. So that's, that's, <laughs> that's the second one is the jumping conclusions. And then the third one we've hit is the should statements. And that again, just really makes people feel badly and keeps them stuck behaviorally. So that shoulds, and I hear all the time, I should be farther ahead, Dr. A, I'm so far behind. Um, and I hear that from people at all varying ages too. So it, and in different ways. So that's something to absolutely be aware of. So all or nothing thinking, jumping to conclusions and should statements, that troublesome trifecta where we really, our goal is we want to catch and conquer those so that we can overcome the anxiety and help ourselves manage our stress more, more effectively. So again, we can feel and be our best.